Today I'm going to be reviewing the Revel Performa B or BE for beryllium. This is the M126BE model. Retail price is about $4,400 per pair. It is a two way design featuring a six and a half inch midwoofer and a one inch beryllium dome tweeter. Overall, I would say this is a very, very good speaker, but it's $4,400 per pair. And this is one of those speakers where it's expensive. And if I had the money, I would possibly own it, but I can't say that it's a good value. This is the case where you're paying a lot more money for a product that not necessarily is a lot better. I would say it is an improvement over the standard Performa 3 Revel products, but I can't say that it's a 50% or even a 100% improvement. And that's the price difference for most of these. Still, with that said, I just love this speaker. And it is a smaller brother to one of my favorite all-time speakers, which is the Revel F226BE. I reviewed that about two and a half years ago at this point. It's been quite a while. And that speaker still stands as one of my favorites. Now, when I listened to this pair of speakers, one of the first things that I noticed was the stereo width. It was just well beyond the speakers. And I love that. Subjectively speaking, that's something that I really enjoy hearing in a speaker. I like to feel immersed in the sound. I don't necessarily care for a speaker that has a smaller radiation pattern because typically they present a smaller sound stage as compared to something like this design. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the data as we go along, but I really wanted to make that distinction up front. That was the very first thing that I noticed and I fell in love with it. The bass on this speaker is neutral, though it doesn't get very, very low. Even in the room, I would say about 50 Hertz is probably about the most you're gonna get in terms of low frequency extension. So you are still gonna need a subwoofer just like you would expect with pretty much any other bookshelf size speaker except the difference in this case is you're paying $4,400 for a bookshelf size speaker. And you may go into it with thinking that, well, it's going to get lower because that's what I'm paying for. But that's not really the case. What you're paying for here is the linearity and the radiation width and Revel's genius engineering behind this product. And, and I use the word genius and that's not me kissing up. They've got some highly, highly intelligent people designing their products and it shows and this particular speaker's overall design. So going back to the stereo width, two particular songs that I listened to that just were really cool with the effects that they do. The Cars Magic, and there's a sound that he makes at the beginning of the, of, I guess of the first verse, and it's pan hard left. Now in more narrow radiation speakers, that pan hard left sound is, is pretty much right at the speaker most of the time. You don't really lose the speaker in the sound stage. It's just like, there it is, there's a speaker. Oh, and that's where that sound is also coming from. But with speakers like these, where they have a wider radiation pattern, that sound is further out. So if this is a left speaker, then that sound is way outside. I would say it's about two to three feet outside of that speaker. If you just close your eyes and you listen and you point, you find that you're pointing about two to three feet outside of that speaker where that sound occurs. A similar thing occurs with Bruce Springsteen's I'm on Fire, which is another track that I really enjoy because there's a lot of ambiance and depth to that track. There's a snare, I believe, that's on the left and a guitar that's on the right. And both of those are hard panned to the sides. Same thing, if you close your eyes and just point to where the sounds are, you're not pointing at the speakers when you open your eyes. You're pointing two to three feet outside of the speaker. And I really like that. Now, the cool thing is, is that you're not pointing way, way outside and you're not really confused where you're pointing because the, there is the case where you will run into where a speaker may have too wide of a radiation pattern for your room. And when that happens, you get so lost in all the reflections and all the ambiance of what that speaker is creating in combination with the room that you lose some imaging precision. So you may not be able to specifically point to, there's that image right there. There's that instrument right there. I can deadlock pinpoint it. Narrow radiation speakers usually will have that distinction. You'll be able to say it's, it's right there. And the precision of the imaging is super focused. And while that's great, I prefer something that's a balance of the two. 
And this particular speaker has that balance. Another thing is that the speaker is mostly neutral. There was only a couple instances where I heard something that stood out to me and was distracting from the music that I listened to, to the point where I thought, I don't think that's in the recording. And then I would go back and listen to the songs on headphones and hear, yeah, that's, that's not actually as pronounced in the recording. One particular area is the ch sound, which is about like two to three kilohertz in most of the tracks I listen to. And there were a few times where it would stand out. So what I did was I grabbed the equalizer and I knocked down three kilohertz and lo and behold, it remedied that. Now I knocked it down about one dB. So it's not a big deal. It's not like a deal breaker, I would say, but it is something that I did notice. Another thing that I noticed was that very high output volumes, and I'm talking stress testing the speaker at about two meters away at about 92 to 93 decibels on average, which is way louder than anybody should really listen to, but I do it for brief instances just to stress test a speaker. In those cases, what I heard was kind of like a glaring sound in the upper mid range. There's a spot in the data that I found that looks like it could explain it, but I'm not entirely sure, but we'll get to that shortly. So speaking of data, let's go ahead and look at some of that. The first thing up is gonna be the impedance plot, which shows us that the minimum impedance is about 4.9 ohms. So this speaker could be driven with an AVR. This is the overall linearity showing the on-axis response at zero degrees, which the speaker is pointing directly at you. The tweeter is lined up directly at your ear. And then also the listening window. And we can see that both of those show a pretty good linearity, although there is evidence of diffraction at a couple points. I'll show you those in a second. I also wanted to highlight the extended base shelf response. So instead of a standard ported design or a standard sill design, what this speaker does is it has an extended base shelf. And it's basically what it looks like. I mean, there's a base roll off right around about 150, it starts to roll, but it extends out instead of just rolling straight down or going down here and then rolling off immediately. So they extend that base. It's very similar to the KEF R3 Meta that I just reviewed. And the notion there is that that combined with room gain will result in a more linear in-room base response rather than potentially being a little bit too boomy. In my listening, I was satisfied with the base output. I wasn't blown away by the extension, but with the response down to about 50 Hertz, I was satisfied. This is the CEA 2034 data set. And I highlighted a couple areas where I mentioned earlier, there is diffraction going on. So there's some minor diffraction going on at around three kilohertz and a little bit less minor diffraction going on at around seven kilohertz or so. Now these actually smooth out with the overall response in the room and we'll talk about that. But before I do, I wanted to point out one graphic which you guys probably don't see often from me, but it's a good graphic to have. This is the on axis response and the off axis response to 90 degrees, so to the side of the speaker. And I wanna look at this particularly because we can talk about the diffraction effects. So on axis is this dark red, and we can see this dip around three kilohertz. And again, this dip around seven to eight kilohertz. Now, what we notice is off axis at around 10, 20, and 30 degrees, those dips kind of fill in with the off axis response, which again, those are indicators of diffraction effects. So diffraction is the sound that hits the edge of that speaker and then comes back to you a little bit delayed. Let's take this three kilohertz as an example. Three kilohertz is gonna go off the dome tweeter straight to your ear but it's also gonna go out to the side of the speaker. It's gonna hit the edge of that speaker. It's gonna cause a reflection. It's gonna come back toward your ear and it's gonna arrive at a little bit later time than that direct sound. That delta in time is gonna cause a cancellation. And that's why you have an on-axis dip at around three kilohertz and another one at around seven kilohertz. Those don't happen as you go more and more off-axis to the speaker because think about it you're no longer lined up directly with the tweeter. Now you're lined up with more of the side of the speaker. So there is no direct sound versus reflected sound. That reflected sound is rendered basically moot. It's going straight to the side of that speaker. And if you were standing 90 degrees off the side of the speaker, the direct sound is the 90 degrees, which also hits that diffraction edge, but there's no delay in time. They both hit that same diffraction edge at the same time. As opposed to on axis, there is a delay in the direct sound versus the reflected sound off the edge and then to your ear. So that's why you don't see those dips going off axis. They fill in off axis. And that's what ultimately leads to a smoother in-room response like we see here. Now, if I draw a trend line through the estimated in-room response, those two dips we saw, three kilohertz and around seven to eight kilohertz, 
I mean, you could argue and say that they're there. And yeah, from this graphic, they kind of look like they're there, but they're not severe. They're not two or three dB dips like we saw on the on-axis response. Now, what happens if you turn the speaker off axis 30 degrees? Because most people that I found, unfortunately, don't understand that speakers are designed to be listened to on axis. In most every case, there are exceptions, but most every case, speakers are designed to be listened to pointed at you. And this particular speaker is designed to be listened to on axis pointing at you. But what happens if you set the speakers up facing straight into the room in a 30 degree implementation? Well, this is what you get. And the main thing to notice here is not just the high frequency roll off, but also the difference in this particular mid-range area. So there is some horizontal radiation discontinuity here, which means that the further you go off axis, the more you lose SPL in this mid-range area. That's not ideal, but in this case, that difference is about one dB or so, so it's not huge. I've certainly seen a whole lot worse, but this is a good idea of why you don't want to necessarily point the speakers too far off axis you should line them up with your ears or maybe at most about 10 degrees off axis. That will result in the best overall sound for this particular speaker. This is a horizontal radiation pattern. We've got zero degrees down here. So this is pointed directly at you. This is to the left and this is to the right of the speaker. And on average, we're seeing it about 70 to 60 degrees wide in radiation pattern horizontally, which is pretty much exactly where I want a speaker to be personally. Now, that's a subjective thing. Some people prefer a more narrow radiation. Some people prefer wider radiation, and that's up to you. But 60 to 70 is pretty much exactly where I want a speaker's radiation pattern to be. So that's why I was so drawn to this speaker when I first fired it up. Well, that and the neutrality, because if it hadn't been neutral, I wouldn't have given a flying fart about its radiation pattern. Now this is the vertical response and zero degrees is your tweeter axis. I'm pointing out this hole in the response at around 1.7 kilohertz, which is the crossover region. So in the crossover region, if you go above the tweeter line, it's not gonna sound nearly as good. Make sure you stay within a few degrees of the tweeter line vertically. This is distortion at 86 decibels at one meter. This is distortion at 96 decibels at one meter. And you can see that both of them are within about 3% down into about 100 hertz and, and even, let's see here, at 86 dB, it's still quite good into about 50 hertz. At 96 dB, which is a good bit higher in output, you do run into some harmonic distortion that goes above three decibels. For a bookshelf size speaker, this isn't surprising to me. Multi-tone distortion testing, where I test the speaker with a lot of different tones at the same time to emulate music, shows me that this speaker stays pretty much below the 3% distortion level which is good. 3% is my personal marker. If it goes above that, then I'm more likely to hear distortion. But if it stays below that, then I'm less likely. If you add a crossover to the speaker and treat it like you would a main speaker that was going to be used with a subwoofer, you can see that the multi-tone distortion does come down a little bit, but it's not a whole lot, which indicates that the distortion from this particular speaker isn't necessarily only from the bass unit or another way of looking at it is at that particular level, you've kind of maxed out the performance of the speaker. You can add a crossover to it, but all you're really doing is making sure you don't overexert the speaker. It's not like you're getting intermodulated distortion from the woofer moving in and out at high output volumes. It's mostly just due to the limits of the speaker itself, which is still pretty dang good for a six and a half inch midwoofer. So now we're gonna look at compression and these results kind of caught me off guard. I'm not surprised by the compression on the low end. I'm not, it's again, a small bookshelf speaker with a six and a half inch midwoofer at 102 decibels. At, that's a lot of output. And even at 96 decibels, that's still a lot of output for a pair of speakers in a room. The, what caught me off guard was this, this increase in distortion. So extra output that shouldn't have been there, which usually is attributed to some sort of distortion at around 1.7 kilohertz, which is, hey, it's the crossover point. That's kind of interesting, is it? So I'm not sure necessarily what's driving that, but there is a difference in the compression linearity distortion factor at the crossover point. And I kind of wondered if this was that glare that I was hearing at around that two to three kilohertz upper mid range region. I was just thinking maybe that's it. There's no way for me to know 100% certain, but I'm kind of just curious, maybe that's it. I also wanted to add in this graphic because some of you may not quite understand how loud these levels are. And I think it's important to note. 
Uh, if you are curious, this is my reference. So all of the one meter references that I'm doing are reference to anechoic. So 76 decibels, 86 decibels, 96, 102 dB. Those are all referenced anechoic. But what happens if you put that one speaker anechoic into two speakers into a room? Well, these are the close to values that you're going to get in the room. It's not precise because it matters you know, how close they are to a wall, but I'm assuming some moderate room reinforcement of about three decibels or so. And this kind of gives you an idea. So if you were listening to this 102 dB level for that one speaker in a room at three meters away, that's 102 decibels. You're not listening that loud. So more realistically, this is kind of the range that you're going to be in. And I would say that as long as you're looking at that red line and thinking that you're probably going to be okay with these particular speakers. But if you plan to listen to these speakers from further away than three or four meters and at high output volumes, then you're going to run into issues. But I, I honestly don't think that anybody's going to be listening to these speakers at that high of output volume. However, this does indicate to us that there are some dynamic limitations to this particular speaker. So if you're listening at moderate volume and you have music with high dynamic range, then the mid range could suffer a little bit and this upper mid range could suffer a little bit as well. Now your mileage may vary, but I like having this data for comparative purposes. That wraps up this review of the M126 Beryllium. Again, to recap, a really neutral speaker for the most part. There are a few diffraction elements here or there, but they smooth out when you consider the overall response in the room. The bass extends enough to get you to about 50 hertz in most rooms, but if you want it to go low, you're gonna need a subwoofer. The wide radiation of the speaker was easily my favorite thing. And I just, I, I loved it. That combined with the smooth linearity makes for a great overall speaker. But I am once again, stuck at $4,400 per pair. It's just, it's a lot of money for a bookshelf speaker. If you have it, if you're curious about it, I think that it's okay to spend that much money on it. But if you wanna look for a speaker that is a value, I can't really call it a value. I mean, it's a great speaker but I can't say that you're getting a whole lot more extra for another $2,000 that you might've spent on the M106. So keep that in mind. Thank you for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing, click the thumbs up button and hit the notification bell to be notified of future videos. I will talk to you all later. Take care.